Hare Krishna. So today we are having a question answer session and uh, if any of you have any questions please feel free to ask. So I'll start with one question which was asked after the yesterday's Bhagavad class which I didn't get time to answer because of that. So basically I said in the first session that devotion is about dedication that if we just have that dedication to serve, if we can't just have to be emotional, that's why Krishna tells be equipoised and focus on serving, don't be go up and down life's ups and downs. But then I also <coughs> while explaining Apichet Sudhrachara words, I said that actually that if you just have the desire to serve Krishna, even if you are not able to do it, even if our conditionings overpower us, still Krishna considers us well situated. So then is devotion about our dedication to practical service or is devotion about our internal, internal bhav, internal consciousness. So actually it is not this or this, it is this and this, it is both and at different times different things might be more prominent so the idea is that the soul is in this world and the soul is <coughs> is obstructed by external conditions and internal conditionings so the world may oppose the soul in the spiritual journey by putting various difficulties and inside itself the conditionings may oppose now at one level <coughs> the conditionings may come in terms of different kinds of desires that come up different kinds of emotions that come up we just feel bored we feel angry we feel lazy uh, we feel greedy we feel various kinds of desires and em these emotions keep coming us and they sometimes obstruct us so at one level Krishna is saying even if these divert you still you may we get diverted but immediately as soon as possible come back on track. So that is the mood of Apichet Sudhracharo. Even if you go wrong come back on track as good. and if you, have, if you have desire to come back on track if your intention is strong then you are well situated. Even if the intention we can't execute it regularly. The other, so the other aspect is that uh, some people say that actually there is no need to do anything external. There is one extreme that people say just keep everything in the mind. Just, just worship the Lord in the mind, why do you want to make any kind of show? The other extreme is people think devotion simply means uh, commotion. Just make a big show and exhibit is coming from the temple and have a lot of bhav and that is what is devotion. So one is keeping all the emotions inside, the other is just being emotional and reducing devotion only to emotion. But the balanced understanding is that ultimately devotion is about serving Krishna. So if the emotion assists us in the service of Krishna, we accept that. But if the emotion doesn't assist us, then we put aside the emotion and we still serve Krishna. So sadhana bhakti is essentially about acting our way to feelings. There are two broad ways which we, we may work. One is we act our way to feelings and the other is we feel our way to actions. So feel our way to actions means we feel like doing something and then we do it. So feeling becomes our way to action. We feel, oh, I, I want to go to the temple, I want to take darshan. And that's why feel our way to action. And sometimes it is we act our way to feelings. That means we don't feel like going to the temple, but still we act. We come to the temple and then we participate in the kirtan, we see the deities, we sing the holy names, we see the devotees, and slowly then some devotional emotion starts coming in. So that means if one is simply at the emotional level, then what will happen is when the emotions feel good, they will do a lot. And when the emotions don't feel, they may not do anything at all. So essentially, bhakti is about the intention being strong, even if the conditions or conditionings oppose. That means sometimes the emotions also oppose us, sometimes the world may also oppose us. But if our intention is strong, 
then we will persevere in our devotion and the excessive emotionality ups and downs that is also unfavorable because if you are too emotionally going up and down when we are up we will act as if we are pure devotees and when we are down we will act as if we are pure materialists not having any devotion at all so the steadiness comes by the steadiness of intention okay so any other questions yes please What makes you feel bhakti is complicated? As we go into more rules and regulations. Can you give an example of what you mean? Like it can be related to deity worship or following the four regulative principles. So like when we start, the process looks very simple. Mm. But as we go in more details, it seems complicated. Okay. So bhakti seems to become more complicated as we go more and more into the details. Yes, at one level, it's a, it's normal in every subject. If you see, if a child is taught alphabet, they simply learn A B C D E F G. They learn some small words, but as they go deeper, they start learning there are so many bigger words also, and there are sentences you make with the words, and there are long sentences. So any subject at one level when we go deeper into it, we see that there is depth to it, there is complexity to it. So similarly with respect to bhakti also, there is, as we go deeper, there is some amount of complexity that comes up. But at the same time, the important thing is not to get too caught or worried about the rules. Sarva vidhi nisheda asur etayo riva kinkaram smartavya satadam vishnu vismartavya jatu chit. The purpose of all the rules is to help us remember Krishna. And if following some rule puts us in so much anxiety, so much agitation that it distracts us from the remembrance of Krishna, then we don't have to go that hard on that particular rule. See, ultimately, every one of us will practice bhakti individually. There are, there are certain basic standards expected, but ultimately bhakti is an individual process, it is an individual relationship between us and Krishna. It is guided and mediated by the spiritual master, the representatives, but the same, at the same time Prabhupada also says in the 18th chapter that the uh, experience is direct and personal, ultimately we will experience Krishna. So we have to practice bhakti in a way that works for us and that means that we can, we don't have to openly reject okay, any rules or again go on a campaign against any rules. If we find any particular rule difficult, then we recognize, okay, this, this is not particularly working for me. Let me do other things and let me move on towards Krishna. So we could say each rule is like one channel for our consciousness to move towards Krishna. So <clears throat> there is a rule and there is a purpose of the rule. The purpose is, purpose is remembrance of Krishna. It's like if there is water flowing, the channels are pathways for the water to flow. But ultimately the water is meant to flow towards the ocean. Similarly, Krishna is the ocean and our consciousness has streams, channels. The water is meant to flow towards Krishna. So sometimes one particular channel may get blocked for a particular devotee and for some other devotee it may be some other channel. So if that channel is blocked and the water does not pass through, then one does not have to obsess on that. Just make sure that the water keeps flowing through the other channels and we keep growing in our bhakti. And some devotees who have a particular interest in a particular service they may actually love all the rules because they want to get it everything right. So, but somebody else who does not have that much interest, the rules may feel like a burden. So we have to see what service we can do constructively for Krishna, what service can give us steadiness and gradually taste and we keep doing that. So if some service seems very cumbersome, 
then we can respect that service and do it as much as is practical for us. But we don't restrict the flow of our consciousness to towards Krishna to only one channel. If that channel is blocked, so we'll keep the consciousness flowing to other channels. Does that answer your question? Thank you. So, yeah, so what is the question exactly? The question is like, uh, even like, uh, uh, yes, uh, even a man of knowledge acts according to his own nature, for everyone follows the nature he has acquired from the three modes, what can repression accomplish? And the next verse is saying, there are principles to, re to regulate attachment and aversion pertaining to the senses and their objects. One should not come under the control of such attachment and aversion because there's coming blocks on the path of sensibilization. So, so how to overcome these uh, attachment and aversion like by higher taste? Okay. Uh, now, so well, how is the question related to the previous words? The, uh, because here in the previous Okay, verse, okay, I get your question. Okay. You're saying that at one level Krishna says repression will not accomplish anything. Mm. But other next next verse he is saying you have to restrain. Mm. So if repression can't accomplish, uh, can't uh, serve anything, then how can we restrain? Mm. That's the question? Mm. Okay. So firstly, Krishna is talking about two different things in those two verses. Mm. If you see the verse after this, Chiriyan Swadharma Vibana Parad Swadharma So there Krishna Krishna is essentially here talking about the Varanas, the Brahman Kshatriya Vaishya Shudra. So he is telling Arjun that Nigraha Kim Karishya, see what can repression accomplish. There was a there's an Indian so-called spiritual teacher whose whole philosophy, you could call it philosophy, <laughs> that was that actually just engage, enjoy your senses. And the more you enjoy your senses, the more you will grow spiritually. And his idea was Sambhok Se Samadhi. And he said the essence of the Bhagavad Gita is this one fourth of a verse. Nigraha Kim Karishasi. That was for him the essence of the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> what can repression accomplish? But actually speaking, just a few verses later, Krishna is talking, the whole section is about lust. And Krishna is talking about you have to restrain. So Krishna is not saying what can repression accomplish means he is saying that just indulge indiscriminately. The point of that verse is in the context of Krishna is telling Arjun that you are on the war field, your nature is for Kshatriya. You are meant to fight. But now if you think you will tolerate, you will forgive, that is a Brahmana's activity. You cannot do that. You will not be able to sustain that. And therefore, you have to act according to your nature. If you don't act now aggressively, you will take on a Brahmana's role and later on you will act aggressively. So, yeah, so Nigraha Kim Karishas essentially means that you cannot suppress your Kshatriya nature. So, it's, it's talking about nature uh, essentially. Now, when Krishna says there are principles for regulating attachment, what he is talking about is there is a Brahman Dharma, there is Kshatriya Dharma, there is Vaishya Dharma, there is Shudra Dharma. So each of them has their own set of rules and, and set of uh, guidelines by which they can regulate and channel their nature. So um, Brahman is told to practice Ahimsa. Shamodamastha Pasha, Shantir, Arjavayavacha, Shanti, tolerate, be peaceful, forgive. But this is 18.42 and the next was 18.43 immediately. Krishna says that when he is describing qualities of Kshatriya, Yudde Chapya Palayanam, that when a Kshatriya has to fight, the Kshatriya will not flinch from the fight. Not forgiveness, fight. So, why is that? Of course, Kshatriya doesn't fight indiscriminately. But the point is that each person has guidelines to act according to their nature. So, we should follow those guidelines. That's what Krishna is saying. And by following those guidelines, you, you can grow. And Generally, if you see, this is related to the question, answer to your question also. 
in the uh, we see that in the bhagavatam when dhru maharaj is very upset he is just a boy dhru so at that time he goes to the forest and narada tells him that dhru actually is a small child don't take such insult if you are a small child you know just it's fun happen it's a small things happen don't take an insult so seriously and if you think you are adult already then recognize that in this world honor is honor keeps coming so just be equal poised so in a sense he tries to checkmate dhruva if you think you are small then children just keep having ups and downs don't take it so seriously if you are adult then also don't take it seriously but dhruva replies at that time that actually what you are saying is true but i can't apply it this is not the level i can practice the words have pierced my heart so terribly that i can't tolerate this pain therefore please give me a means to rectify the dishonor that i have suffered so here sometimes we have this uh, understanding that the mode of interaction with the spiritual master or spiritual guide is simply of submission and yes submission is required no doubt but along with submission there is also negotiation negotiation means that if this i don't think this is practical for me then when we tell why it is not practical then the spiritual guide will tell okay if you can't do this you can do this so we have to come to a mutually acceptable way of working and that's what krishna is telling nigraha kim karishasi so what is a mutually what is a acceptable way of working for kshatriya is not the same as for a brahmana so you work according to your nature and sometimes this negotiation we may have to do within ourselves also i want to be here but right now i can't be here so just because i can't be here doesn't mean i have to be here i can be somewhere in between and from here i can aspire upwards so that way when we learn to find out the level at which we can practice bhakti sustainably and by that sustainable practice we become purified and then we can rise to a higher level afterwards also okay thank you yes prabhu uh, if you see the bhagavad gita it says in <coughs> ajamil story that he took the lord's name once and he went to seven rajendra moks one day one time he said it they were elevated but when you see this uh, namukra <coughs> if you make a mistake or if you do there are so many aparad you counter it so mm. how to see that because it's contradicting one says just by taking one time a name doesn't matter because as i mean intentionally call narayan that's true he just intentionally but when you intentionally chat they said well, there is a namukra mm. so it's it's contradicting okay. within it um <coughs> so if there is an aparad chanting the holy names then if now ajamil chanted once how was he so much benefited okay gajendra also <coughs> now there are different context for different statements and in certain context when a particular statement is made that statement is best understood in that context the the story of ajamil has a particular intent that intent is to stress the magnitude of the mercy of the lord coming through his holy name that even a person who is so degraded can get saved by the chanting of the holy names now when scripture wants to draw some principle uh, illustrate some principle it often does it through extremes like this is the sixth canto the previous can- the ajamil story in the fifth canto there is a story of uh jal bharat or bharat maharaj now a person who is so elevated is renounced a kingdom and then goes into a forest and gets attached to a deer you see how absurd how is it possible but when this whether it is a positive thing or a negative thing the negative thing is if a small attachment can divert us so much so that is de- illustrated in a very extreme way and the positive is also illustrated in a very extreme way so now the extreme by by the word extreme i mean extraordinary not extreme in the sense of an extremist just is exceptional so the extraordinary or the exceptional is not the standard 
it is meant to inspire us to follow the standard process with greater caution and greater attention. So, this is, oh, there is such a great danger of attachment and diversion that we now get attached to other things. Similarly, the, if, the, if, if you look at the Bhagavatam itself, what is the conclusion over there? The conclusion of the Ajaman section is not that oh, all of you also do whatever you want, sen be sensual and at the end of your life, when you are about to die, take a gun, put it on your forehead and Hare Krishna <laughs> and shoot the gun. Now that is not the conclusion of the Bhagavatam over there. The Bhagavatam's conclusion is that if Ajamal chanted once, even unintentionally and was delivered, then if we chant regularly and intentionally, won't we be delivered? So extraordinary examples of mercy are not the standard. They indicate the magnitude of the compassion of the Lord. And by seeing those extraordinary examples of mercy, we can feel inspired to follow more diligently the standard process. So Ajamil is not the standard for everyone. Ajamil is the extraordinary example of mercy. Now the standard process of sadhana bhakti is given in the Puranas and Bhaktivana Thakur has elaborated it and he, there the offences are there. So now when, we, when there are offences in chanting, that doesn't mean the chanting is not beneficial. Even then it is beneficial, but it is not fully beneficial. So the idea is, it's not just a matter of uttering some mantras, it's a matter of developing a personal connection with the Lord. So if we have a personal connection, naturally we will chant the name also attentively. If we are calling someone, then we will call them and pay attention to them. So the idea is we don't have to be uh, very calculative or very apprehensive. Calculative means, like Ajamal chanted once, he got so much, if I chant once, I am not getting that much. You know, bhakti is not mathematical. Bhakti is interpersonal. And we want to connect our heart with Krishna's heart. So we don't have to be calculative, but at the same time, we don't also have to be apprehensive, fearful. Oh, you know, if I commit offense, what will happen? If I commit offense, what will happen? Just try your best to serve Krishna. And it's a personal relationship. The aparads, they're, they're not meant to make create fear within us. The aparad is primarily meant to help us understand that the holy name is not ordinary. It is sac the holy name is sacred. And let's try to approach it as a sacred uh, sound and chant attentively. So, the, the, so then, is it that uh, somebody who is chanting in Nava Bhaz or Nava Aparad will not get purified? Well, many of us who are chanting have experienced purification, at least to some extent. Then, however, is it that all of us chanting Shuddha Naam or Nama Bhas? We may or may not be. So, technical systems of classification are primarily meant to help us act as a show a map along the way. So, there is no need to become apprehensive. Just keep chanting as well as you can, and the, bhakti, the process of bhakti will apply and will become purified. Okay? Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, uh, I just want to uh, develop a question about Mataji uh, and I want to question him to it. Uh, so he talked about the last time the repression. I wanted to ask you to read like um, if the child really wants to eat the mud, the mother will ensure that the mud is not delivered to him and he doesn't do it. Right? So similarly, why does Krishna make lust easily available to us when he knows that it is not good for us uh, if he is merciful? Because as I was just giving the example, I got it. Uh, the mother will not make those hmm. things available for you. And the second part of the question is, wouldn't it be easier if we remember our past life? Uh, easily, because we have forgetfulness, we forget about our past life. Because if we know what all misery we faced in our past life, we were just like Jadhara. Yeah. It becomes easier that we have to focus on Krishna consciousness. We would That's remember it as the of the mother, but as soon as we come out, the Maya Devi, yeah, and true. so why does that happen? Forgetfulness. Yeah. So, first question is that. If mother would not allow a child to eat mud and would not keep mud nearby also. So why is it that Krishna keeps 
lust so easily and widely accessible for us? Well, <clears throat> it's not that Krishna is doing it. It's the way the material world is constituted. So there are two ways of looking at the material world. One is that we could say everything is happening under Krishna's arrangement. But the other is that the material world is having its own governing principles. Say for example, in today's world, uh, if sensual images are there everywhere, now is this Krishna's arrangement? No, maybe uh, even a few hundred years ago, few, or hundred, few, uh, few decades ago, it was not like that. So we can't ascribe human doings as God's arrangement. So, so the excessive sensuality that is there in the world today, that was not there even a few decades ago. It's in many ways it's unprecedented in human history. Especially with our devices giving us access everywhere. It's, it's unprecedented, definitely. Uh, having said that, it is true still that overall sensuality is much more easily accessible than spirituality. No doubt about it. And that has always been the case. And the reason for that is that this world is a place primarily to facilitate the fulfillment of the desires of the souls. So, in the Vishnu Sahasranam, one of the name is, one of the names of Vishnu is Kama Kamada. He is the giver of desire, which Baldev Devashin translates those names in different ways. So he says, he is the giver of desire and he is the fulfiller of desire. Now we say, why should the Lord give us desire? Now when he says, he is the giver of desire means that actually speaking, every desire which come, pops up inside us and then a desirable object that is there outside. Ultimately, we choose that desire. So, life is like a multiple choice exam. And in the multiple choice exam, the knowledge of the correct answer is given by the teacher in the normal classroom. And the exam with all the wrong options are also given by the teacher. But it is the student who has to assimilate during the studies and then apply during the exam and take the right option. And in any multiple choice exam, the number of wrong options will always be more than the number of right options. <laughs> so similarly, in the world, sensuality will be much more widespread than spirituality. And as I said, another reason for that is that because the world reflects the kind of desires people have. Say now, I'm saying, I just mentioned that, say as compared to three, four decades ago, the amount of explicit sensuality in the world today is much more. Why is that? That's because of, at one level, people's desires. People were always sensual, you could say, but so brazenly or explicitly sensual, that is happening in recent times. So, because in general in the world, people are more materialistic. So, material desires and the pathways to fulfill those material desires are more easily available. And it's not that all lust is bad. Krishna also says, Dharma avaruddha hoteshu kamos nivaratarshaba. So, the, if we understand that it's also God's arrangement for procreation, then we see that that is also not necessarily a bad thing. It's an it's arrangement through which procreation happens. And it is only when we artificially separate the pleasure from the procreation and seek only the pleasure, that's when we go against nature. So, Krishna's purpose is, see there is a love that guards and there is a love that guides. Both are loves. But, you know, the love that guards has to end at some time. If parents are very overprotective of their children and then eventually the, the parents are not going to be there all the time. If for every small ch problem, the child runs to the mother, say the child is playing with someone and another child pushes the child and the child starts crying and runs to the mother. Then the mother may intervene, but how long can the mother keep intervening or the father keep intervening? When the child grows up, the child has to stand up for oneself. So there is a love that guards, there is a time definitely when we have to guard, but then there is also the love that guides. That you don't guard, you face life, I will guide you how to face life. So for most of us, in the material world, Krishna's love is the love that guides. 
The material world is a place where there are temptations and to some extent if we live in a sattvic or a spiritual environment, the temptations can be lesser. But ultimately it is the love that guides. So if we regularly hear scripture, regularly connect with Krishna, then that message of Krishna will, will permeate into our consciousness and it will arise within us at the right time so that we will be guided properly. Now the second question was that won't it help us if we remember our past lives? I'll answer it in three broad ways. First is that uh, not necessarily. I wrote a book on reincarnation where I'm demystifying reincarnation. I have studied almost several hundred cases of uh, boy of children who remember their past lives and then shortlisted about 25 of them in my book. After I published the book, I decided to do some further research to find out how many of these children who remembered their past lives actually became more spiritual because of that remembrance. And not even one. Not even one. In fact, there was a case of a person who was named William Barnes and he was some James Black or someone, he was the person who had designed the Titanic and he had sunk along with the Titanic and William Barnes says, I am the reincarnation of this Jones or whatever and now he gave a very reasonable explanation of how the Titanic sank. He said that before we Titanic went on its voyage, first voyage, I was testing and I used a hammer to hit the hull and at some points the hammer it started resonating and he said I told our financer that actually we will have to thicken the hull because if any of the points where resonance is happening if there the iceberg collides the, it won't be one hole it will break at multiple places but the financer he said that oh no no we have already planned everything we can't spend any more money we can't delay anything so he brushed aside my objections and then the, sh the ship went and then the ship sank and then that financer blamed him. So this, uh, so this will, William Barnes, he, he actually explained that because of resonance, the Titanic sank, and then some scientists did some experiment and said it's a, it's a reasonable explanation because the way the jet sam of the, uh, the debris, the remains of the Titanic were there. So I'm not going to go into the merits of the case. But this William Barnes, he says, my mission in life is to clear the good name of Jones. His name was impugned by the financer. So he is not thinking, oh, I died and I was born again, so there is something spiritual and I should pursue spiritual life. No, he is thinking I have to clear the name of this person. So basically what happens is that um, spiritual, a spiritual drive depends primarily on intention, not on recollection. Even these people who remember their previous lives, that doesn't necessarily impel them to practice spirituality. Now, having said that, uh, let's look at that particular second, second point you mentioned was that the child in the womb remembers the previous lives and prays to the Lord. Now, at that time, the child also prays, my Lord, please don't let me come out of this. Because outside the world is illusion and I don't want to get into this world entangled. So please let me stay here and let me remember you and stay devoted to you. But then, why does he come out? See, the point is that, that devotion under duress, devotion under the compulsion of the situation, it is, it is still devotion, but it is not mature devotion. It is, it's like, if I have nothing to do, nothing else works and that's the time when I turn towards Krishna. Good, at least then you are turned towards Krishna. But then, what is happening? Krishna is your last alternative. But devotion is, Krishna is our first alternative. So, if we practice bhakti simply because of the fear of the consequences of our misdeeds, that is devotion at the level of fear. You know, there are four levels of devotion, fear, desire, duty and love. So, 
Uh, so that is also good, but that is nowhere near pure pure devotion. So certainly we need to have some fear of the consequences of our wrong actions, but fear of that fear driven devotion may protect us from doing wrong, but it won't really connect our heart very deeply with Krishna. And it's like, see, you know, you, if your child always obeys you, but the obedience is simply because if I don't obey, my parents will cut off my pocket money. <laughs> well, okay, at least they're obeying. But how much of a personal bond is going to be formed by that? It's only by fear. There has to be more of appreciation, reciprocation. Then that's positive. So that's the second point. That if even if we could remember our past life misdeeds and the consequences of the misdeeds, and because of that we chose, okay, I don't want to do this. I want to do this. That is simply driven out of fear. Mm -hmm. So the devotion that is driven out of fear of the consequences of bad deeds, it is devotion, but it is not a very high level of devotion. It is certainly not pure devotion. And the third, last, third point will be that when we practice bhakti, at that time, in certain exceptional situations, some souls may get remembrance of their past lives. Like Jai Sajjad Bharat remembered that I had made a mistake. Now, these extraordinary situations are primarily given to highlight a particular point. So the point in Jada Bharat's story is that how ultra cautious he had become. Mm -hmm. But now is it really described that Jada Bharat was constantly remembering and berating himself? Now, why did I do that? Why did I do that? Why did I do that? No, Jada Bharat was like when he was instructing Rahugana, he was focused on instructing Rahugana. So he was not really living in a perpetual black flash of a previous life. Why did I do that? Why did I do that? So sometimes memory may be given in exceptional situations for particular purposes. Usually the children who remember their past lives, it's most often because they die suddenly and the soul doesn't process the event of death. It's like it's, 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 we leave India and come to Australia, the body still has some jet lag. So like that we could say that some souls when they, they die in some murder or some violent accident or something like that, there's like a soul lag. The soul is still in the previous body for some time. And usually these memories, they don't stay for life. Uh, about 7, 8, 9, 10, maybe they go and meet the person in the previous lives and then the memory subsides. Then even if they remember the memory, it's more, more like a cognitive memory, it's not an emotional memory. Yes, I used to remember my past life in my childhood, but nothing, no emotional intensity involved in it. So generally, the normal system is that, that every new life is an opportunity for the soul to start a new chapter. So what has happened in the previous chapters does matter. But we still have the opportunity to make a fresh beginning. That's why we are not given remembrances of past lives. It's actually, it would become an unbearable cognitive overload. If you start remembering everything that we have done in the past. Say, if you meet, say if you meet some family member or a friend. And at that moment, as soon as you see them, if everything you have done with them starts coming in your mind. Now you will be able to function at that time. So like that, if you start looking at, say, you are walking along and slip and fall. I slip and fall, did you slip and fall because somebody has spilled water here? Or you slipped and fell because in your past life you have done some karma? Which past life? And what was the karma? So if you start going into that causal connection, the whole principle of karma is not for post-mortem. It is for prescription. Karma analysis, we start going to post-mortem. Why did this happen to me? Now, it's, it's practically not possible, but even if it is possible, it will be just overwhelming. So the principle of karma is meant more for prescription. Do this, don't do this. It is not for post-mortem at all. Okay? Thank you. Very good. Any other questions? Yes, please. So, we do a lot of uh, festivals and uh, rituals and all this. Do we really do those things or 
Like what? Like recently we have Mahashivratri. So in my family we used to do fasting and night outing and all these things we used to do. Mm. So that was there in the mind substantially. Yeah, consciously mm. that okay today is Shivratri and we have to do fasting from day or morning to evening. So all these things are there. In the morning we do some Sandhya or some Mm. Some other festivals will come, so we do uh, okay. puja of the gods and all these things. So how? Okay, good question. So should if in our family certain festivals like say uh, Mahashivratri or others were celebrated, then should we celebrate them or not? Bhakti Nath Thakur discusses this in Chaitanya Shikshamrit, and he says a devotee uh, may be involved in three broad kinds of festivals. The devotee's heart is in the Vaishnava festivals. Janmashtami, Gaur Purnima, Ram Naomi. This is where his Lord is glorified and the devotee wholeheartedly participates in that. Apart from that, there could be other religious festivals. When Bhakti Thakur was there at that time, Kali Puja and all that was very big in Bengal. Even now it is. So he said there is other religious festivals. They are not, they're non Vaishnava religious festivals. That is second. And third he says is, there could be general, general social get-togethers. Say, in today's context, we might say that in India there might be Independence Day, here there might be Australia Day or whatever. So, he says the devotee's primary purpose is to celebrate Vaishnava festivals. And other festivals, a devotee will do whatever will cause the least disruption in society. So, these festivals are not bad. They are also at one level, uh, say religious festivals are pious, even if they are not concerned with Krishna directly. And other festivals they are just remembering some special event in the memory of that in, in that particular region or that whatever. So a devotee doesn't have to go out of the way to disturb. A devotee may not go out of the way to celebrate these, but a devotee doesn't have to go out of the way to disturb also. So if, if people in general are practicing it, are doing it, and not doing it will unnecessarily uh, create agitation in people's minds, will create hostility towards the devotee, will make, the de will make people start perceiving devotion negatively. Then those are the considerations primarily. Then if it is required, one can participate. And it said, it's in the Bhagavatam that Prutu Maharaj, when he was performing yajnas, at that time he was there also yajnas being offered to the devtas and he was in the mood although the externally the mantras for the devtas were chanted internally he was in the mood that devo narayana angaja that they are all parts of vishnu and he was offering prayers to the devtas in the mood that you are all the devotees the assistants of vishnu so devotee can have that internal consciousness and we can appreciate every situation in a way that it is favorable to our devotion. <clears throat> so, you know, our movement is quite influential in England. So, we are, uh, the Bhaktivedanta Manor is like the leader of the whole Hindu community there. So, every year, because of the multicultural environment, they celebrate in the House of Commons various religious festivals also. So, when they celebrate Diwali, so our uh, the, so our temple president from there, Shruti Dharma Prabhu, he was invited to the Diwali program, uh, to, to, the pro, to celebrate Diwali and he was the leader and some other Hindu groups were also there. So then he had to speak over there. Now he, is, uh, he spoke up very briefly because he didn't, don't have much time, All this, the, at that time the Prime Minister of Britain was also there. So then he spoke basically that Diwali is a festival of gratitude, that the, Ayodhya was, the, the residents of Ayodhya were happy that Ram came back. And he shifted from the Ramayana to the focus on gratitude. And because it's a political setting, so he said, that what can we be grateful for? So he said, we can be grateful for life, we can be grateful for the opportunity to practice our faith, and we can be grateful to the country that has given us the freedom to practice our faith. Now, when he spoke that, all the politicians there appreciated that. Because their interest is in the country, their interest is not in the religion. So then, you have to speak accordingly. 
So we don't give up our principles, but we present our principles in a way that is conducive to the particular occasion. So, so we don't have to go out of the way to celebrate. We don't have to go out of the way to avoid celebrating. We try to Krishnaize it as much as possible. Okay. On the same subject, hmm. if she was the greatest Vaishnava, why is Mahashwarati not part of Vaishnava festivals? If she was the greatest Vaishnava, why is Mahashwarati not a part of Vaishnava festivals? Well, Hari Bhakti Vilas does say that we should celebrate Mahashwaratri also. Now, uh, there is the Acharyas ex prescribe different practices on scripture based on what is most beneficial for the people. So, in today's world, often there is confusion in people's mind about who is supreme. And when we worship Shiva, we might create within or perpetuate within people the misconception that okay, Shiva is supreme. So, we might be worshipping Shiva in the mood of a devotee, but that is not what people will pursue. So, that is why there has to be a little caution. Because say, when we say, when we do puja to Prabhupada, we are very clear philosophically. Prabhupada is not Krishna, Prabhupada is a representative of Krishna. But because the devtas are also themselves objects of worship, so sometimes they may be seen as alternatives to Krishna. So, to avoid their confusion, devotees do not publicly worship the devtas. That doesn't mean we publicly disrespect them, but it's just that we don't in our temples have elaborate worship of the devtas. If we chance to go to a place where devta, devtas are there, we will offer our respects to them. Answer your question. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes. So, uh, what is in uh, we are we saw the anomalies in Kaliga. Firstly, he gave the Vedic anomalies as the solution for the suffering of all. And then when he was responded that upon Narad Muni's advice, then he glorified Bhakti and so Bhakti is the solution. So, Shiva Vyasa Dev being Krishna himself, you know, what would have been his uh, strategical thinking uh, in giving the Vedic governments as a solution in the first instance, which actually perhaps is a uh, complicated thing because many people have taken that as the path of solution. Mm -hmm. And in contrast, when we see, when we see Shiva Prabhupada, you know, it takes Okay. Okay. Good question. So, why did Vyasadeva even give the Vedic atonements when actually they are not practical, and he eventually had to give bhakti? But Prabhupada gives bhakti everywhere, directly. There is. A recommended way, but there is also in the broad Vedic context uh, freedom of choice. That means this is the way I recommend, but if you don't want to take this, that doesn't mean you are doomed. The, the, the broad Vedic tradition offers us what you could say as user friendly spirituality. So, user friendly means that okay, whatever you want to practice. At that level, you can fit in. Since there are certain religions which often offer spirituality, this is the way. If you are not following this way, you are going to go to hell. It's either say my way or the highway. Hmm? But the Vedic way is not like that. The broad Vedic tradition is: if you can't follow this, then follow this. If you can't follow this, then follow this. So Krishna himself has instituted the tradition or, or the, as, as, through the scripture, Krishna has instituted the system of the worship of devtas. So for those who can't worship him, Krishna doesn't say you have to go to hell. You worship someone else. Stay within the house of the Vedas. So the house of the Vedas has the innermost chamber where there is this treasury of bhakti. But for those who are not ready for it, those who are not interested in it, the house of Vedas is still very big and people can come in different chambers of that house and find something interesting. And that's how they, they get connected and they stay at least within the house of the Vedas. So in fact that's what wherever we want to do outreach in a broader setting, then what happens is that if 
we have multiple activities temple is one place where you have worship but if there are other things over there if there is yoga there is schools there is there is free food there is some cultural activities bharatanatyam or whatever then people may not come for the temple to the worship but they will come for so many other things but they are coming in the temple premises they are coming in contact with devotees so prabhupad stress prabhupad had very little time with us after he started the krishna conscious movement he was there just for 10 11 years so prabhupad is purports stresses bhakti everywhere but at the same time prabhupad does give us the scripture by the scripture everything is all the other paths also are given so the idea is that vyas dev strategy is at one level you cast the net broad at another level you pull the net inwards so when you're casting the net try to get as many souls within the vedic fold as possible but when you want to take them out it is a bhakti which will actually take them out of the material world and towards krishna so both approaches are valid so rather than seeing that this or this it is this and this it's like a pyramid on the pyramid at the top you could say is bhakti but along the side of the pyramid there are different people following different paths and they are also rising on the path of consciousness it's better to be a pious materialist than to be an impious materialist so the vedic atonements are basically for people who are not yet ready for bhakti but they don't want to be materialistic at least they have that much consciousness and i don't want to that this is wrong and i want to atone for it at one level surrender to krishna is very easy at another level it's very difficult it's easy because the practice of the path is easy in one sense not very difficult austerities but it's difficult because at one level we have to give up our ego and independence that we have to surrender to krishna which is a little which is difficult for some people okay yes please yes from yeah yeah mm how can we ensure that our children when they go into teenage they still stay connected with krishna mm there was a american author who said when i was 15 my father was a fool <laughs> now i am 25 and i am amazed how much the old guy has learned in 10 years <laughs> 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 so <laughs> in the teenage is the time when the children are discovering their identity so before the teenage they are identified primarily as you know this per- this person's son or this person's daughter their identity is very much locked to their parents identity when they go into adults at that time they will have their career they will have their job they will have a position so they will have their own identity but in the teenage they are too old to be satisfied with their parents identity connection with the parent and they are too young to have formed their own identity so it's a very turbulent phase and at that time it is even if somebody is not necessarily practicing spirituality or religion still the turbulence comes up so what we can do broadly speaking is that one soul can influence another soul only in three ways like as i said in the childhood there is i talk about love that guards and the love that guides so in the childhood there is love that guards to be protect our children keep them in a protected environment but as they grow up we can't keep them in that protected environment all the time so we can guide them in broadly three ways one soul can influence other soul only in three ways this provide knowledge provide inspiration and provide facility or you could put this as as three is enlightenment encouragement and engagement enlightenment means you know if you do this this will happen if you do this this will happen don't just give rules 
is a lecture of Srila Prabhupada where he is talking to a uh, morning walk, he is talking to devotees and he says if you, this devotee is going to go to colleges and present Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada said the worst thing that you can do in college programs is present Krishna consciousness as a set of rules. He said that the worst thing, youth are never interested in the rules. He says that I was at an interfaith conference and there was a Christian, he was joking, he said, we did a survey among youth, random youth, what is their conception of a priest? So he says, a priest is someone who is constantly worried that someone, somewhere is having some fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, their conception was that the priests are meant to spoil all our fun. <laughs> so, if you present too many rules, do this, don't this, do this, do this, don't this, it just becomes too restrictive and repressive for them. So, there is a big difference between uh, most of us who came to Krishna consciousness by our choice in our adulthood and our children who are more or less born in Krishna consciousness or grow up in Krishna consciousness. For most of us, we might have had some culture before, but the Krishna conscious principles and practices are much stricter than the broad pious culture. So for us, first came the philosophy. Oh, we are not the body and the soul. And when the philosophy was understood, then after that, all the rules and regulations started making sense. And then we chose to follow them. But for what happens for our children is, first the rules and regulations come. Do this, don't do this. And somehow we have our schools where we tell some Krishna stories and we memorize, get them to memorize some shlokas. But I have seen that uh, I was in America and there's a devotee, his, the father is a very good preacher, the mother is like a counselor for the congregation. And the son was talking with me and the son said that, is there any evidence that God exists? He, not that he doubted, but he said, I have never seen any evidence, any convincing evidence. And then he was a skeptic. So we had some discussions. He said the standard design argument, it doesn't make sense to me. So we had some discussions. So the point was that he had never had any forum where he could have the intellectual pathway to Krishna consciousness. How it intellectually fits in place, how it makes sense. That's why enlightenment. That's the point I'm making. You know, we have to not just give rules but tell. Why are we doing this? And why, what is the harm of not? Why should we not do this? Why should we do this? So, that kind of rational spirituality, not just cultural spirituality, that is very important to present at the right time. Mm -hmm. So, and the, and the teenage is not necessarily the right time, but it is the beginning of the right time. So, first is enlightenment. Give knowledge of what is like, this is the path which will take you here, this is the path will take you here. And the second is engagement. Engagement means that kids like to hang out with kids of their own age. And they need to be presented bhakti or presented engagements in bhakti in a way that that feels comfortable for them. If you ask them to come to the temple and attend classes for adults, it's not going to work. Yeah, so many, most, almost all kids like kirtans. They like to come for kirtans and participate in kirtans. And there's one temple in America I had gone and they said that they're trying to get their kids to come, teenage and little older than teenage kids. Most of them are not ready to come. And then and they decided that we want to make our temple green. And they called the kids and said, can you become in charge of making the temple green? So then the kids started coming to the Sunday program, not to attend a Sunday class, but to make sure that everything is green. <laughs> so many times, especially in this generation, there is a desire to be some kind of an activist, to do something tangible, not just worship. So engagement means we have to find out creatively how best that we can connect what they are doing with Krishna, how we can engage their energy in Krishna's service. That has to be individually seen according to each person's situation. 
the prabhupada gives a very innovative explanation of this yena kena prakarana mana krishna nivesha somehow that the fixed mind of krishna prabhupada says that this means it is the responsibility of the spiritual master to find ways and means by which the disciple can fix the mind of krishna and as the prabhupada said this whole krishna consciousness movement is practically invented by me prabhupada said at the same at one time he said that i have not changed one word i have just given what my spiritual master has given but prabhupada here says that the whole idea of rath yatra dancing on the streets in western countries is prabhupada thought about that's the way the devotees could fix their mind on krishna so we have to sometimes stretch our brain a little bit to find out ways and means by which we can uh, they can be engaged in a forum that they feel comfortable and third is encouragement encouragement means that often say we tend to catch our children doing wrong instead of catching them doing right even why are you not doing this why are you not doing this why are you not doing this and even if they do right so i was in dubai and the devotee and the children were talking with me they said that so this devotee's daughter was saying that my parents are never satisfied with me so i said what happened he said that you know i started chanting four rounds and i told my mother i chanted four rounds yes so when are you starting 16 now <laughs> so <laughs> since so you are appreciating me chanting four she said when are you starting 16 so he said, i felt so discouraged by that so at whatever level they are practicing appreciate that it's it's very difficult and many devotees i have seen that if the parents stay maintain a nice relationship even the children don't practice bhakti once they grow through that go through the adolescence once they start settling down in life then they start realizing the value of bhakti so even if they go away temporarily no don't get too worried about it it they will go but they will come back they have got the bhakti impressions just don't make it a uh, like a ego issue or a personal prestige issue or oh, my child how can my child not be a devotee i am a devotee i am a devotee. my child should be a devotee don't see it as a personal failure it is just that every soul has his own journey has his or her own journey to go through and they will come at their place so our children should never feel that our love for them is conditional to their practice in bhakti that whether they practice bhakti or not our love for them should be there there are love and there are expectations so every parent will have expectation for the child natural less natural but the love should not be conditional to the expectation if you do this that's wonderful but even if you don't do this i still still love you so when they see it that way they won't feel pressured to practice it but rather they will choose to practice it over a period of time that will happen okay okay yes yeah he the tvan nivartante how do we understand that we will never fall back that beldev devarsh explained this elaborately in his last verse anavritti shabdat in the govind bhashya commentary in the vedanta sutra there he says that actually lord the lord is so eager that the soul come back that the lord descends from the spiritual world to the material world to take the soul back so why would the lord ever let that soul again fall back from here so anavritti shabda that's the last declaration of the vedanta sutra anavritti means never come back again shabda this is the declaration of scripture our punaravarti no is anavritti no avartano so he says that this is the declaration of scripture and this is also we can see this from the personal nature of the lord as the lord is Uh, so eager for the soul to come back so why would the lord let that soul fall back again and as far as we ourselves are concerned we if we are to go back to the spiritual world it is that we resist the temptation of the material world we reject the temptation of the material world that's only only then we'll go back so then if we have rejected those temptations a life long or many lives depending on how long we have done the sadhana 
when we were in the world of temptation we rejected the temptations why would we ever get tempted like that when we are beyond the world of temptation so both from the perspective of our experience and our realization our practice from the perspective of declaration of scripture and from the perspective of the personal nature of the lord's mercy we can be reasonably confident that what the lord says once we attain his abode we won't fall back a oh, free will always applies but the misuse of the free will is is of an extremely low probability it's not impossible but it is so low as to be impossible okay, it's like in hindi they say dood ka jala chhaach bhi phook ke peeta hai if somebody has drunk some hot water once burned twice shy as they say if he's taken some hot milk and burned the tongue the next time when you get the buttermilk which looks like milk <laughs> they will cool it and drink it so after we have the experience of the struggles in the material world it's a, it's the free will is never taken away but the chance to misuse the free will is uh, disappearingly low okay hey krishna yes okay teach me Hmm. But if the horse is not thirsty, it doesn't matter if you are going to break the water, the horse is not going to drink it. Yeah. Then you are basically saying, if a person is not seeking spirituality, it doesn't matter how hard you try, it's not going to work. Hmm. Now, the question is, where do we uh, understand whether the horse is thirsty or not, and should we try to okay. try to reach our answer? Good question, yeah. So if a horse is not thirsty, taking it to the water is also not helpful. So if people are not spiritually seeking, then what is the point of uh, trying to share Krishna Bhakti? Yeah, I would say that there are three broad categories. One is people who are deeply looking for spirituality. Mm-hmm. Say so there are some senior Prabhupada disciples who actually left their homes in search for God. They traveled across the world. so they were very seriously seeking god now most of us at least i didn't go out searching for god rather god's devotees came out searching for me <laughs> <laughs> so now in the second category are a large number of people who don't think that they are searching for spirituality because they don't know what is spirituality all of us have particular conceptions of our spirituality is and based on our conception and feel this is not for me so in today's world there are we all always but especially in today's world our perceptions are formed in hundreds of different ways and based on how our perceptions are formed uh, we may we may just keep a long distance from certain things even if they are not that even if we would be interested in them otherwise so this is a second category where people will be open to spirituality but they themselves may not be interested because they don't really know what is spirituality and a third category is people who are just not interested so you could say the first category will be very small second category will be reasonable third category will be huge so with respect to the third category people are just not interested all that we can do is just give them some agyan sukruti give them some prasad give them some maybe they can keep some sacred books at their home or whatever and let their spiritual journey just start with some baby steps so such people if we push them too much we will alienate them so we can't push people too much so if they are not interested we open the door of spirituality for them sometimes what happens we open the door and if they refuse to come in then we bang the door in their face you, know, you are a materialist you are a demon you are go to hell and suffer no 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 not like that 
you know at the end of an interaction with the devotee if a person doesn't become interested in bhakti the person should at least feel i met a nice person that appreciation itself is good for them so for most people in third category if we just give them a positive perception of krishna bhakti that's also good enough for those in the second perception bhakti tirtha maharaj in one of his lectures said that the duty of a preacher is to find out what are the obstacles between a soul and krishna and remove those obstacles so it's not just you know, give a lecture or come to the temple we find out if if we are interacting with people okay what is stopping this person from coming to krishna maybe it could be some cultural barriers i don't i am not comfortable with this and not come or it could be some intellectual misconceptions it could be some practical requirements in their life or whatever so then we find out what is stopping them and try to remove them so most of our outreach will be in the second category so these three categories that i'm saying also is that prema maitri kruh apeksha yah karoti sa madhyama madhyam adhikari it says those who are envious keep a distance from them so those who are innocent show mercy to them and those who are devotees become friendly with them so there are some people we might meet and we just meet them and we feel they are already so spiritually evolved it's just that they are continuing from their previous lives again there will be a few like that also so we focus on the second category and create a uh, create just some agya sukhti in the third category and how do we know whether somebody is in the second or third category it is basically we might invite them once twice thrice if people just absolutely say no at all then just leave it but if we give them some opportunity to open up and they say you know i don't like this then we can address that so if they are open to having their conceptions uh, uh, conceptions examined then we can help them to come to a better understanding okay. yes Okay. Mm. Yeah. So, if we see statements uh, of promises of reading scripture, Falashruti, are they devotional audacity? Not exactly devotional audacity. Uh, different devotees have different understandings. I have discussed with various devotees. Uh, broadly speaking, the Falashruti. indicates the magnitude of the mercy of the lord that is possible but that doesn't necessarily mean that is the mercy that everyone will get by that as the lord is so merciful that by hearing this past time once you can get you can get love of god that's wonderful but what if somebody doesn't get that love of god that doesn't mean that that promise is not necessarily true it just means that 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 particular activity might not be done in the right consciousness that doesn't mean that doing it in the not in the right consciousness is not having any effect it's like somebody says you know you just hit one arrow at the bull's eye and you get the olympic gold medal and your name will be emblazoned in gold plate in your country's history yeah it's all true but there's much more also this true to hit that one arrow in the bull's eye in olympic so one has to shoot thousands of arrows in practice before that so similarly when scripture tells us that if you hear this past time you'll get purified or you'll get love of god all that is true but then we also need to have that desire for love of god we also need to have the consciousness that is receptive to be filled with love of god krishna cannot or krishna will krishna will respects our free will so that he doesn't force himself into our consciousness mm-hmm. so it somehow if some past time says that you hear this past time and you will get love of god and you will attain the spiritual world and somebody hear that past time and they go to the spiritual world and in the spiritual world they are there 
and they are asking, what is the cricket score? <laughs> <laughs> so, if the consciousness is not attached to Krishna, just physical relocation to the spiritual world is not enough. And uh, Krishna cannot, Krishna cannot forcibly impose love of God on us. So, he can give us love of God if he want it. So, we, what we say is that this is the, it is indicative of the magnitude of the Lord's mercy. But whether that is the magnitude of mercy which every person will get or not, that will vary from person to person. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, how do we balance the idea of not repressing yourself at the same time avoiding things that are unfavorable to Krishna consciousness? And especially, how do we guide this towards this balance, new people? Ultimately, Krishna consciousness has to be practiced by each individual. And we have to, we have to help people find a level at which they can practice comfortably. Comfortably in the sense, not that they go into the comfort zone, but comfortably in the sense of sustainable. It, it is... So, when we talk about comfortably practicing Krishna, sustainably practicing Krishna Bhakti, our, our purpose is that based on that person's level of experience, level of realization, we have to give them, like, take one step forward. From where you are, take one step forward. So, that is one of the offenses to the holy name is, not instruct faithless people, people about the glories of the holy name. One way to understand that offense could also be that if we instruct people in things which they can't have faith in at their level, giving that instruction itself is not healthy. So, there are many aspects of Krishna consciousness and everything has to be told at the right time. Sometimes, it, we uh, we are not very discreet about what we present when. Say, suppose some new iPhone comes up and the new iPhone promotion is there. Say, iPhone X or anything after iPhone X is there? Whatever. Okay. So, iPhone X comes up. Now, imagine the promotion or the advertisement, the commercial of the iPhone X is there. First thing they start, $1800. Will any commercial start with the price? Any any promotion of any material starts with the features. Okay, this speed, this lightweight, this feature, this feature, this feature, this feature. And at the end of it, somewhere down, you will see, okay, this is the price. Hmm. Now, of course, if somebody else wants to do some, somebody wants to do something else, somebody has bought a phone and they are very proud of the phone and they want to brag about how wealthy they are. They say, you know, this phone is $1,800. So, that is simply to brag. So, similarly, when we are presenting Krishna Consciousness, in any kind of outreach, now first we have to tell what is the product and then tell the price. But often we tell the price first. And we are very proud. Know this, know this, know this, know this. 
and people say, okay, no Krishna consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to start with the features. What is it, what is in there for them? And when they feel the benefit of Krishna consciousness, then they will take steps, take forward, take steps forward. So broadly speaking, in the initial stages, if the success can be defined at different levels differently. In the initial stages, if people just keep coming for the programs, that itself is a success. They come once, twice, thrice, that's a success. If after that, they get their friends also for a program. That means they like it so much that they want to share it with others. If they come to the program and want to do some, can I help in any way? They want to do some volunteer work. That's even another level of success. If they want to follow the what what principles can I follow? Then they can we can encourage them to follow in a way that doesn't disturb their life too much. Because most of us today, our movement itself um, is mostly a congregation-based movement now. So all the devotees are practicing bhakti. They are living in the outer world. So they have to interact with and to some extent integrate with the outer world. So what happened, our movement started as a, almost a temple based movement. Even at, when the movement started, even those who were grahasthas were also living in the temple. So it was a very, uh, very sharp demarcation between those who are devotees and those who are not devotees. But now it is various levels of integration are there, not that kind of demarcation. That's why uh, it's not that people have to necessarily leave the world to come to Krishna. They will be, they will live in the world and through there they will come to Krishna. So it's rather than telling people that you have to reject this or reject that, just what you have, you build on that. And uh, as far as repression, this is a broadly a big subject, but I have said that there is. Uh, the in sometimes you separate this is material, this is, this is spiritual, this is material. But that's too broad a classification. So in material, there is sattva, there is rajas, there is tamas. So or you could say that there is pro-devotional, non-devotional and anti-devotional. So the pro-devotional doesn't have to be given up at all. That can be channeled. The non-devotional, it depends on okay. The anti-devotional that are there, some things depending on how, how much they are ready, those can be regulated or removed as much as possible. So it has to be done individually, case by case. And always the stress has to be on connection. Just connect with Krishna. The idea is that if we start filling our consciousness with Krishna, then other things will automatically go out. If we try to people put, give those away, it will be difficult for them. Just fo always focus on trying to connect them with Krishna and they will find out for themselves what best level they can connect and how much they can disconnect from the non-devotional and anti-devotional things. Okay? Does that answer your question? Thank you. So, was there one last question here somewhere? Okay. So, thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada ki Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki Gaur Premanande.